Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the January 11th, uh, 2022 Board of Ed meeting. Do I have a motion to return to public session? Monica first, Malesh second. Um, and I will uh, call the meeting to order um, and ask if we have a motion to approve the minutes from December 7th, 2021. Alex first, Jennifer second, all in favor? And is approved. Um, and now a motion to approve the November Treasurer's Report. Monica first, <laughs> my pizza second, and I see all in favor. Uh, and it is approved unanimously. Um, we, we have recognition of community. Victoria, would you like to take that? Yes, I'd actually like to ask Kyle Hosier to. Um, Turn on his camera and uh, talk about our students and their recognition. Thank you, Victoria. Good evening. I am pleased to share the news that our academic challenge team placed first in the MCC tournament held on December 12th. Students on our team include Bhavani Gopal Krishna, Justin Hugh, Daniel Kim, Arya Kumar, Iris Liang, and Ryan Powell. Congratulations to our entire academic challenge team and their advisor, John Scutero. I also wanna take a moment to recognize one of our seniors, Justin Wood. Justin earned first place in the 198 pound weight class for 16 and 17 year olds at the US Powerlifting Association competition in Massachusetts over the winter break. Justin broke and set 10 New York State powerlifting records in his age group and weight class. During the competition, he squatted 413 pounds, bench pressed 264 pounds, and deadlifted 523 pounds. With these results, Justin is currently the number one powerlifter in New York for his age and weight class in the U.S. Powerlifting Association. Justin has also qualified for several national powerlifting competitions including a competition in Australia in October. Justin, your hard work is paying off. Keep it up. Congratulations. And back to you, Victoria. Thank you, Kyle. Any other recognition of community? I'll hold back from commenting on what Justin did <laughs> as a minor power wing with for myself, but that is just really extraordinary. By saying that he is has the national record in his weight class, it means for all ages, and that to me is just absolutely staggeringly impressive. So, congratulations to all. Congratulations. Um, acceptance of gifts. I see that we yes. have two gifts. I'd like to ask the board's approval of two gifts. One from anonymous donors requested for Edgemont Athletics in the amount of $14,450. And to the Edgemont School Foundation for a grant for Sealy Place to create bi biography project for $497.80. We have a motion. Many pizza first with Jennifer second. And I see we have all in favor unanimously. Thank you enormously to our donors, Anonymous and Maine. We are deeply grateful to you all. Uh, next up is the uh, superintendent's report. Yes. Great. I have um, two quick updates before I turn it over to um, Michael Curtin and Paul Garfano. Um, just uh, briefly on health and safety update. Uh, the last 20 days have certainly been by far the most challenging for us regarding contact tracing. As of yesterday, 224 faculty, staff, and students tested positive over the past 20 days. So that was about 10%, about half were prior to the break, and about half since we returned, but most did test positive over the break. We are committed to being open, we are committed to being in person, and we did return from the break with a renewed attention to our multi-layered mitigation strategy, most importantly, masking and social distancing. Um, I also want to thank everyone for participating in the weekly testing. Last week, we did have a record number of people who were testing, and I just wanted to share our consent rate at this point with the board. Uh, it's approximately 60% overall. We have uh, 
65% at EHS have given consent and 57% in each Greenville and Sealy. So again, approximately 60% overall. So in the category of changing guidance, I know so many of you are watching the news and following CDC. And just so you know how the typical flow of information goes for us, it goes from the CDC to the New York State Department of Health to the Westchester County Department of Health. So yesterday, we did get new guidance from the New York State Department of Health. And just before this meeting this evening, we received an update from Westchester County. And there are two significant changes from Westchester County that we will be uh, meeting with the administrators, processing it, and then getting together a communication first to send out uh, to work with the nurses and the staff, and then to follow up with the community. And the two changes are, are the reduction in both the isolation period for those who test positive and the quarantine period for those who are close contact. It has been reduced from 10 days to five days if asymptomatic. And of course, there are many details that go around that with how to count the days um, and, and, and the symptoms. Um, since we just received this guidance, we'll, be follow, we'll follow up with the communication, as I said, with more detail uh, a little bit later in the week. Um, we expect to be, begin our test to stay program on Tuesday, January 18th. What that means is that um, those who are close contacts and who are un, unvaccinated will be able to test at school for three out of five days. So we will, we have received tests from the state of New York and we will be again, specifying that in terms of the actual days of testing, but uh, the students are required to test three out of the five days. Uh, as always, this is for um, asymptomatic or re resolving symptoms. If students, adults, are, are symptomatic, please keep your students home. I know we have a lot of conversations back and forth about runny noses and, and we will continue to have all of the conversations about runny noses, but please do um, follow our guidelines. The most recent letter that was sent out on December 29th can be found on the district website. It's in the quick links, COVID communication, and that's where the most accurate up-to-date information about symptomatic students can be found. Um, regarding uh, vaccination clinic, we are having a next uh, vaccination clinic. We'll be sending that out on January 22nd. It will be the COVID-19 vaccine for ages five through 11, first or second dose, ages 12 plus, either the first, second or booster. And for immunocompromised ages five plus, there will be a third those available. We have the space so that we'll be able to have two sections. So also um, there will be availability for people who are looking for COVID testing in addition to vaccinations. That'll be on January 22nd, 22nd from 2 p.m. to 8 p.m. We did have one clinic over the break and uh, we did have 15 people tested and about 160 people were vaccinated during that last term. So, Ryan, anything I missed or anything you want to add to that update? No, I think uh, you know, information regarding both of those two changes forthcoming. Hope to get them off the ground as soon as we can and early next week at the latest. Any questions from the board at this point on, on, on any of that? Yeah, just, the, just around the test to stay program, that also applies to teachers and faculty as well. Correct. 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 I didn't have a question. I just wanted to comment. You know, today for various reasons is one of those days when it really hit me what a really long road this has been and what an incredibly heavy burden it has been. Um, I'm tired. I'm guessing the teachers are tired. I'm sure you're tired. And I just wanted to acknowledge and thank the community, the teachers, but also you guys, the administrators, for all the work the the endless work it's been. And like I said, today's just one of those days that it hit me 
And so I wanted to say something. I wanted to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It certainly has been a lift. I can't thank the, the teachers enough, the staff enough. They definitely are on the front lines and, and, and we talk about heroes and uh, keeping schools open has taken an entire community. Um, so we're appreciative of all of the faculty and staff, all of the administrators, all of those who are home contact tracing and making those phone calls right now and, and to the administrative team. Thank you for the recognition. I'll just echo that, uh, but on on basically talking to the community that uh, there should be a huge sense of gratitude and pride in what the teachers and admin have done. And I just want to now not act as a board, but mm -hmm. represent the community and say that it's generally have a huge sense of gratitude and pride. So yeah. thank you, teachers. Thank you, administrators. Yeah. I would echo that on behalf of the board as well, <laughs> for sure. Uh, for everybody. Because I actually have uh, a question about the clinic on the 22nd. Uh, you'll send out a sign up link for that or people just show up? No, I will send out a flyer which has a QR code. Okay. Just sign up. And it will be at EHS or yes. at okay. yes. Any other questions? No. Just a, a very brief uh, update on the uh, district goal progress. Uh, by the end of January, all three district committees will have met. The educators uh, component of the, of the committees have been meeting and the, the idea is to share that work and some drafts and to engage uh, the rest of the district committee in that discussion for feedback and for uh, additional um, input. Um, also, the, uh, tonight's agenda is Stacy Williams. Uh, she is a consultant who well, we have interviewed a number of consultants to help us with our diversity, equity, and inclusion policy in terms of the implementation and, and the procedures uh, associated with that policy, but also to do some training for, for teachers. We're uh, targeting the middle level. We're looking at, and, and Mike probably talk a little bit more about that this evening, but uh, she is on tonight's agenda. We expect her to be able to give us feedback on the action plan, but also to include her in, in the trainings. Um, so with that. Just thinking, just a quick update in terms of staffing. I think uh, you know, coming out of the break, obviously, as Victoria said, we had a number of people test positive, number of people as close contacts. Um, staffing was, was challenging. Uh, to say the least, we are seeing some resolution to that. Um, it's been a, an interesting, uh, it's been very localized to individual schools where the challenge has been. And so I think Sealy was in a really good position early on um, and they've maintained that. The high school had some challenges and I've started to resolve those. Greenville was our, our most difficult staffing situation coming out of the break, um, but we made some significant strides today with people being released from quarantines and isolations um, as of today, prior to the meeting, we have 15 staff members who are out as positive. And of them, uh, I believe four are teachers and three of which are, are classroom teachers. Um, others, um, you know, filling in different roles, almost like district-wide positions as well. Um, so we're starting to get to a point where we have some more normalcy and we hope that that trend continues um, right now, it's not to say there aren't others out for other reasons or, or as those contacts, uh, but simply from that group of 10% that Victoria highlighted before, uh, we've really seen some significant progress in the last, last two days. Brian, is, is that what led in part to the decision to, um, to, to call a, an emergency day last Wednesday for the full day as opposed to just the, the delayed? start or Victoria. So so people were not able to get here due to inclement weather. Mm -hmm. And because we were already so stressed with staffing that additional staff, um, which was quite a majority of the staff, were not able to make it here for the delayed opening. So maybe if we were able to do a four hour delay, but but we, we definitely could not get here in the two hours. You know, I, 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 I wanted to highlight that because I wanted to point out just how stressful the situation has been for 
you all, but for the teachers as well, um, for, for those who have not tested positive, and even for those, obviously for those who have it, it's their own level of stress, but for those who remain in the buildings, the additional um, burdens of having to step up and, and help out, and for you all as the administrators too. I, I just I wanted to recognize that small piece of the, the, what you are yeah. And I think to your point, Judy, aside from the two uh, snow slash ice days we had last week, each day we are doing uh, basically a staff analysis. Right? We had a critical shortage, and is there any risk of us not being able to, under any creative <laughs> means, be able to open and provide that opportunity for students? And um, I think it has pushed us to really think about that. And, and we've had some um, low attendance numbers and realized we, we can do this in creative ways still. So that's still kind of our North Star and, and trying to make sure that each day we can uh, accomplish that. We appreciate the creativity. <laughs> well, and, and the teachers who who've agreed to take on extra classrooms right. and to cover for their colleagues. Absolutely. Yeah. Do it and and teacher aides who are doing yeah. a tremendous amount of work substituting for teachers who are out. We have teachers, you know, uh, working from home and, and uh, we have supervision in the classroom by other colleagues helping out. So, uh, it has certainly been all, all of the units and, and everyone's work that's been this year. Yeah. Along those lines, can you can you address the substitute situation? Uh, so th uh, thank you for asking. Um, we need substitutes. Uh, so, so many community members had reached out previously, and we did follow up. Uh, some people were able to come in and help, but we are very much looking for substitutes. Uh, please contact Amanda Defonce in the district office. She uh, will be reaching out. We'll send something out as well with a summary of the board meeting asking uh, for all hands on deck in terms of substitutes. Thank you. Okay. I think we're okay to uh, great. Yes, okay. up to Michael Burton. Great, so as Mike's getting settled in, and Mike, you just have to turn the, um, the switch on the, the controller there. Uh, last time we met, we, we outlined the budget development process. It feels so long ago already <laughs> to us, or to me at least. Um, and we outlined a lot of the known factors that we had in December and, and the unknowns that were still resolved. Most of those unknowns, those critical ones at that time, are, are still unknown. But we actually, there's a lot of uh, information that will come in in the next seven to 10 days that will help us start to uh, formalize our, our full budgetary plans. Um, as we spoke last time, with each session as we move forward, we'll bring in different departments to discuss their budgetary considerations. Tonight, we have two that are really at the heart of teaching and learning. Uh, Dr. Mike Curtin's here to talk curriculum and instruction in the budget related to that. And Paul Garifano will speak about the technology budget in STEAM. And I think if you go back a number of years ago, technology felt like outside of that instructional lens, and it is just so integrated now into the fabric of what happens every day in classrooms. Um, that we really um, <clears throat> purposefully plan for them to be here together tonight to talk about things. Um, what they'll speak about tonight are, are their budgetary considerations, their, their kind of plans at this point in time, um, obviously open for a conversation and discussion with the board. And we're not yet at the point where we've refined or even come to a generalized number of what we think the budget should look like. Um, and so they'll be speaking tonight about uh, highlights, understandings of our district goal and how it connects to their. Um, their, their specific areas, and uh, there'll be further com conversations and opportunities to unpack these at a much more granular level, looking line by line as we get to the, uh, the early March phases of our budget process. Um, and then secondly, I think, you know, next time we meet in February, uh, we'll be talking a lot about staffing, both at the uh, individual school levels, um, but also as a as a plays for other departments, district level positions, curriculum, uh, technology, and, and STEAM. We'll try to keep that um, kind of contained within that, that one conversation as well. So with that, I'm um, happy to have Mike, Dr. Mike Curtin here to talk a little bit about curriculum instruction. You want me to queue up the slides, Mike? Yes, please. Uh, good evening, everyone. Happy New Year. Mm -hmm. Hello to everyone out in TV land. Um, so yeah, tonight I'm gonna give an overview of um, what uh, I think we're hoping to accomplish through the 2022-23 um, budgets that focus in on curriculum and instruction and highlight some of the 
changes, shifts um, that are occurring. Um, and also talk a little bit about the process um, just to, to sort of fill in uh, the board about the process that we use in identifying what areas of the curriculum are um, worthy of uh, focus and work at any given point in time. And also do a little bit of a look back too. So that's kind of what I have planned for the next uh, 10 or 15 minutes or so. The next slide, please. So I thought we'd start by just looking at, at, at what the budget what the story of the budget was this year. Um, this year, in, in terms of the six or seven uh, budget codes that relate directly to curriculum and instruction, about $180,000 was the spend on, uh, on these various things. And I'll take a little deeper dive into what that represents in a little bit. But um, some of the main things that we worked on this year that, that were sort of features of this budget were. Um, um, re-engaging with Jill Akers Clayton, uh, who was a consultant we have worked with in the past um, at EHS on uh, designing and implementing problem-based learning units. Um, Jill is beloved by our teachers. She's been here a number of times um, due to COVID and other issues. We've had a two-year hiatus um, where we haven't worked with Jill, but she worked with um, one group of teachers for two days back in um, November, and she's going to be working with another group. And actually, we uh, engaged with the leadership team at EHS, the department chairpersons, to have all of them attend Jill's next workshop. So we're really excited about that sort of building capacity inside of the building to um, support uh, this kind of assessment. Um, secondly, this year was the first year where we gave the Renaissance Star math assessment to uh, many of our elementary students. We gave it to all students in grades two through six. And what the Star assessment is, is a computer-based test that um, works adaptively as the student answers questions. It gives them harder questions or easier questions and gives us a good sense of uh, where the kid is um, and collectively where the kids are in class or a grade or even an entire school in terms of their mastery of the standards. So we did one round of that in September. We'll do another round for the end of the year. Um, we felt this was particularly important this year because um, math um, being so sequential where each topic builds on what came before, there were obviously a lot of concerns about, well, what did kids miss or forget from the COVID uh, 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 hybrid remote learning time. And so this we saw this as a good opportunity to use that assessment to, to learn more about that, to kind of target instruction. Additionally, as you, I think you know, on the reading side, um, we've been doing the Fountas and Pinnell um, benchmark assessment for a number of years, but we don't currently have a universal assessment in elementary school and the STAR math assessment seems to fit that bill very nicely. Um, this year, this current year, we extended use of the Science 21 curriculum into uh, fourth grade. Um, each year, BOCES revises the Science 21 curriculum for one grade. And it, so it's been kind of rolling up since we first adopted Science 21 um, when we went to full day kindergarten um, four or five years ago. So I'll talk a little bit more about uh, Science 21 in a few minutes. Um, we continue to do great work with Shelly Klein, who works with our elementary teachers on um, originally reading. Uh, we had a reading roadmap that I'm sure many of you recall. Um, and all of our elementary teachers have received extensive training through Shelly um, on how to teach in a reader's workshop format. For the last few years, we've had a number of teachers um, asking, well, when are we going to start it on writing? We really need to do something about writing. So this was the first year where we had a pilot um, where teachers in grades K, 2, and 5 um, had the opportunity to teach a, a writer's workshop unit. Um, and then the next, uh, well, I'll talk more about next year shortly. But um, so we're making a shift with Shelly from reading to writing. And uh, we had three grades engaged with that this year, and there will be additional grades next year. Um, finally, you're very much aware coming into this year that, that 
Um, kids were struggling with lots of different issues, academic, behavioral, social, you name it, um, as they came back to school. And we saw this as a good opportunity to look at the support systems that we have in place for kids and how we could um, work with a consultant, Jim Wright. Um, he's been helping us to identify and implement simple classroom-based interventions that hopefully head off problems before they become bigger problems. Um, and so we've been working with Jim on that this year. Um, next slide, please. So uh, very quickly, I'll just remind the board and more importantly, the community um, that we, we are uh, working on our district goal, which has three components. Uh, those components are understanding of self, which really is kind of a focus on social emotional learning, um, understanding of others, uh, which deals more with diversity, equity, inclusion, and then connecting learning to life, which is at its core means uh, kids value the learning experiences that they have here, see them as relevant and um, applicable to the world outside of Edgemont. And um, so those are all different areas that we're working on. Um, right now, as, as Victoria mentioned, we have committees working on those three components to develop action plans. Many of those action plans do include curriculum related items. Um, and so that's a, an example of where the district goals kind of drive some of the curriculum work. Um, anytime a teacher or someone proposes an idea for the curriculum project, we always look to whatever district goals we have to say, is this directly or maybe indirectly contributing to us moving forward on that goal? So that, that's an important sort of um, yardstick that we use. Um, and certainly an example of that is when we solicit um, proposals from teachers to do summer curriculum work, we identify right up front, like these are the district goals, these are the areas that will be prioritized in terms of identifying which projects are funded. And so we pay a lot of attention to using the district goals as a tool to kind of um, inform the work that we do on reviewing and revising the curriculum. Next slide, please. So I wanted to dig a little bit um, deeper into this question of process and specifically how do we decide that X part of the curriculum is due for some TLC um, and it's kind of there's not there's no one single uniform way that that happens there's a lot of things that go on where we're looking at curriculum and considering the way kids needs are um, evolving what I think is a common thread among all of them is that they're collaborative and largely data driven. Um, so on the left hand side of this slide, you see um, some of the things that, that the groups or activities that may drive curriculum work. So for example, Tri-States comes every two years and um, they leave a whole lot of recommendations and um, we oftentimes act on those recommendations in terms of items in the curriculum that we should be looking at. Um, if there is an EHS curriculum committee that meets yearly to review proposals for new courses, they just met back in December, we have two new courses that are being um, looked at for possible inclusion in the EHS curriculum. Um, departments uh, here at EHS and grade levels to a lesser extent in the elementary schools um, set goals every year and identify areas that need improvement or that need um, reworking. Um, certainly I mentioned already summer curriculum lighting proposals. Um, a lot of the committees that we have, I, I already mentioned how the district goal committees are um, including in their action plans, ideas for curriculum development um, but certainly our reading and writing committees, for example, have oftentimes, I'll talk it, uh, in a moment about elementary word study and phonics, which is a good example of that. Um, those committees oftentimes sort of spawn curriculum projects. And, um, you know, review of assessment data that we have. And one thing I, I thought of really as I was just sitting outside is that 
sometimes the state releases new standards, right? And so there's a there's new or revised standards, and we have to adjust the curriculum to make sure that they align with the state standards. Um, I thought I would share a couple of examples that, that sort of show these various bullets at, at work. So in case of Science 21, which I mentioned earlier, when we made the move from um, half-day kindergarten with callbacks to full-day kindergarten, we spent a lot of time talking with the kindergarten teachers about um, well, how, what's, our, what's our vision for kindergarten? Um, and how, what does the curriculum look like? We decided we wanted uh, a hands-on science program um, and we're aware of Science 21, which is used extensively in the region. I would say the majority of districts in, in Southern and Northern Westchester are using it. Um, and not all knowing that we wouldn't adopt a curriculum in just one year, we actually held a series of meetings with the K-1 and 2 teachers. At one point, we had a presentation by the, the sort of the creator of Science 21 to K-1, 2, 5, and 6 teachers. Um, we visited Osborne School in Rye, where they had already started using Science 21 to observe it. And when I say we, I mean myself and a team of teachers. Um, so that was a, an example where um, a shift in the schedule for the, the sort of broad program of kindergarten led to adoption of a new curriculum, um, which has since then, as I mentioned before, rolled up to subsequent grades. Um, it is important to note though that, that there were stakeholders, teachers from many of those other grades to which it's rolled up who were involved in the initial consultation about Science 21. Um, the World Languages Department, in the wake of their tri-states visit, um, they were very interested in something that the, the visiting committee told them, which was we should be looking at common assessments and common measures. And so they decided to work on um, something that the National Council of Teachers of Foreign Language um, uh, had, calls the, the oral proficiency interview, which is like a standard interview process for assessing a kid in a authentic way to understand their mastery of language. And they had professional development around that. Um, and it changed the way that they assessed their students. And, and so that was sort of spawned by a, um, a tri-state division. Um, in the case of the selectives program that we have here at EHS um, in the English department, that was something that really came right out of the department and their goal setting. It was certainly informed, I think, by our emerging awareness that um, the curriculum that we teach should foreground student voice and choice. And so rather than monolithic, you know, American literature, why not give kids to look at things like, you know, um, race and gender in literature or um, persuasive writing and give them some choice about what their last two years of high school English look like. And that the committee under Liz Scott's really excellent leadership sorry, the department under Liz Scott's really excellent leadership kind of took the horse by the reins and did a really nice job um, with, with myself. And I think it was Devin at the time, sort of as partners to support them. What can we, what do we, what do you need? Have you thought about this? And then finally, elementary word study. Um, word study refers to essentially um, in Reader's Workshop, we focus primarily on comprehension and sort of a holistic view of reading, but um, kids need to learn phonics. They need to learn how spelling works, how words work. And so that's what word study really refers to. We went through a year long process um, in the elementary reading committee where we really wrestled with which of two programs with two competing philosophies we should adopt. And that included piloting those two programs, that included presentations from um, the companies that made them. Um, we consultation with Jackie Levine, who's the literacy, literacy coordinator at uh, Putnam Northern Westchester BOCES. We visited three other schools um, and had a lot of, I'd say, somewhat heated debates 
about which way to go. And of course, one school wanted to go one way and the other school wanted to go the other way. And um, we ultimately chose, I think, um, a path forward that makes a lot of sense and has been implemented now for uh, about three years. Next slide, please. So looking ahead, um, what's on path for next year, hopefully? These are the things that I anticipate us working on, many of which really represent continuation of projects that were begun this year. Um, it's been great being able to shift our focus back to um, you know, um, thinking about program, thinking about the curriculum and the instruction from just last year where we were you know, just treading water and barely so. Um, and so, but the, that pace has been slower as we still continue to deal with all the stuff that Victoria described. Um, so a lot of this stuff has uh, more work to be done connected to it. So um, tiered systems of support and interventions I mentioned earlier. The focus this year was how do we support these kids coming back from a year of, for lack of a better word, chaos. Um, but now we can take a slightly deeper dive and talk about, well, what are the support systems that are in place? How can Jim um, help us to identify um, support systems so that even if there's not a pandemic, but a kid is struggling, we have a sort of system for first meeting their needs in the classroom, monitoring how they're doing, and then looking at successive levels of more intensive um, support for that kid. Um, this year, this current school year, we rolled out Science 21 to fourth grade. Next year, in keeping with their revision of the science curriculum, FOCI's revision, they will, um, they will release fifth grade. And our fifth grade, we anticipate, will also um, be doing Science 21 next year. Um, we are planning to expand the use of Renaissance, the Renaissance Star Assessment. As I mentioned, this year, we started with grades two through six math. We're going to add in reading next year as a um, so we have a, a second data point to complement what we already have with the um, Baptist and Pinnell assessment. And we may start using it in the lower grades of EHS as well to kind of um, help us understand the needs of kids individually as well as collectively in terms of uh, math, probably. Um, uh, Victoria mentioned that we are hoping to work with Stacy Williams, who is a professor at Marist College um, uh, and an expert on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And she's going to assist us um, in uh, implementing that part of the, um, the action plan and then also training some of our teachers in how to respond to, to bias related incidents and, more importantly, how to prevent them from happening in the first place. So she'll be working primarily, at least in the beginning, with our middle level teachers and um, school psychologists and counselors. Um, we'll continue to work with Shelly on Writer's Workshop. I mentioned that this year, three grades piloted a single Writer's Workshop unit. Those three grades will continue with more, uh, a more in-depth use of Writer's Workshop. And then we'll take the next three grades so we did K, two and five this year, we'll take one, four and six, sorry, one, three and six next year, and, and they'll do the one unit pilot. So we're, we're instead of working with three grades with Shelly next year, we'll be working with six grades with Shelly. And I'll, that, I mentioned that because it's reflected in um, the costs that we'll be, we'll be expect to incur working with Shelly next year. Um, and then finally, we, we hope to continue to work on assessment with our ES, EHS teachers and problem-based learning and assessment. Um, that work that I described earlier that's been so successful with Jill Akers Clayton. Next slide, please. So uh, very quickly, the breakdown of, um, I mentioned that there are seven um, codes that relate in some way to curriculum and instruction. Um, and this really is the breakdown. The largest portion is um, for BOCI services. That includes everything from paying for my learning plan, which is the um, software we use to um, track professional learning, to paying for 
Olas, where we do all of our hiring through. And then Shelly Klein, traditionally, she's been in the consultants line, but we are now working through BOCES to, so we can get aid back on the money we spend on her. So she's now part of BOCES services. So there's a big jump in the number for BOCES services this year. That's partly because of just accounting, moving things over from consultants. Um, and it's also because we're, we anticipate working with Shelly a little bit more next year and also paying for additional Renaissance star um, uh, tests. Um, next slide, please. So put it all together, and I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation that we spent um, uh, about $180,000 this year on curriculum and instruction. And uh, I anticipate, based again, as Brian said, this is all very sort of, it's, it's more than back of the napkin, but you know, it's, it's also not written in the good ink in the, with the fancy pen. So it's somewhere in between those two. And um, you know, it looks like based on, to accomplish various things I've outlined here, we require about $221,000, which is a significant increase in terms of percentage, in terms of the dollar amount, it's about $40,000 difference. So I think that it's uh, money well spent. Um, I, of course, I welcome the um, feedback and questions of the board and the community in, as we continue the budget process and continue to develop the budget. Thanks, Mike. I think just to add on to that, when we look at the line by line, we can start to see really where those increases are. I think it's also uh, worth pointing out it's the budget in 21, 22. One area that I think Mike pointed out when we met and we're going through the budget development process is we often undershoot our consultant line in this area. And so we have built in a contingency um, expenditure for consultants as well. Uh, you know, for example, tonight we're looking to adopt some uh, or to get some resolution on consultant work. And knowing that we have a history of in the curriculum instruction bucket, Kind of undershooting that number, we, we have are showing an increase in the budget to budget, which isn't necessarily an increase in expenditure to budget from, you know, from this year when we look at it, or just a smaller increase. Judy, can we pass it back to you for any questions? I think we probably take them as two groups separately. Uh, when you break down staff development and consultants, Clearly, some of the consultants are doing staff development. Yes. So, staff development, that money is specifically for um, the teachers who come in during the summer to develop curriculum. So that's that, the, the $52,000 there is not to pay the consultants, it's to pay teachers who come in during the summer to, um, to write curriculums. And if we had had a, if a consultant was working in somehow, some way with teachers during that time, that would be separate. That would be in the consultant the bucket. Is always going to be right. So the orange yeah. you see on the screen here is, is targeted okay. money for teachers for curriculum development work. Yeah, that name is a little bit misleading. Thank you. Yeah. So first of all, uh, thank you, Mike, uh, for that presentation. And I love the time you spent on justifying 22% increase. <laughs> but sorry? Was, the time you spent on justifying the 22% increase. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so number looks large, but given how integral it is for keeping the high standards of the school district, uh, I, I must say that you have my outright vote for this because the numbers are small. I wouldn't look at the percentages. Thank you. Uh, second is, I love the jargon you used that uh, which curriculum needs TLC. <laughs> and, and, you know, given how the whole setting the agenda sounds collaborative process of talking to teachers, talking to consultants, and talking to taking feedback, I was a little surprised by the heading of the next slide, which says anticipated projects and challenges. So what are the challenges? I didn't get why there are challenges if it's so collaborative and it's uh, you know, kind of so supportive by people. Well, yeah, the way I set that slide up initially was a little different. But, uh, <laughs> um, no, I mean, like, you know, supporting kids um, is always a challenge. Like finding ways to, to help kids who are struggling in one way or another is always a challenge. And the type, types of challenges that we see um, from year to year change. This year was particularly uh, challenging challenge. But um, you know, we, we we become aware of, of new areas. You know, that's just one example. Um, challenges like um, the need for common assessments to understand 
as a grade level, you know, um, where are our fifth graders, for example, in terms of their math learning, right? So um, we've all sort of accepted the challenge of uh, looking at Edgemont's curriculum through a diversity, equity, and inclusion um, lens to, under, to understand how it, it supports, how it represents um, students from different backgrounds. And so, you know, challenges, I mean, there's always challenges. And so these are sort of more the, not solutions, but the ways that we're addressing the challenges. I didn't quite name them, but um, so this is more of a focus on outputs than inputs in terms of challenges. I hope that's clear. <laughs> thank you. I was just curious about that. Thank you. Well, thank you. You're welcome. You guys make one quick comment. Thank you, thank you for bringing up the relative size of the budget because I think for me, over the last two years, when I meet individually within the, the departments and the groups, it just becomes so apparent, right? We, we talk all the time about how the vast majority of our costs are in um, salaries and benefits. I mean, it is truly the vast majority. When we think about the importance of curriculum and instruction, and we look at the amount uh, budgeted here, when we factor in the salaries associated with it, it still falls less than 2% of our total budget. Um, and so you know, we, we do consult with a lot of people and we have a, a, a lot of programs that are ongoing um, and looking at each one, none of them are cheap, but the, the overall cost and the impact is, is actually really impressive what we get out of, out of that cost. Yeah, so before I get back to what I was going to say, the word you just used is the one I would use. The impact per dollar spent in this area is so outsized compared to anything else we spend money on. So yes, I mean, obviously we always want to be careful how we spend any dollars, but um, yes, to Nilash's point, I'm not, at least at first blush, worried so much about you know, the percentages, the dollars still, you know, as long as we're being thoughtful about how we spend them, I think it's an area we probably all, you know, get behind. I'm not asking for more spending, but good if, if Probably justify. Um, the other part is really, since I know we will be further on in the process, delving into more detail on these things, and also once things are firmed up a little more, but it's, it's really more of a request. Um, and I know from, you know, we have this in lots of places where how we do our accounting doesn't necessarily how line up well to how we as board members or community members might think about what things are actually being done, what benefits we're actually getting. So to the extent, you know, the BOCES, and, and again, we're, we're all fairly familiar with BOCES and why we use BOCES for a lot of things, but you know, to have half of your budget in one line here, again, for accounting, it doesn't, we don't care, but it'd be nice to have more detail about what that looks like. For example, I think it's in Science 21 part of BOCES, yeah, it, it is, but it's not part of that budget line. Oh, okay. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, that's that's easy enough to do. You'd like sort of an itemized list of what what are the different at least services. The bigger pieces of it. I mean, yeah, down every. It's dollar. actually relatively few things, so I, I can I, I can route that to you through Brian or Victoria. That's yeah. easy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and as you were speaking, I was actually thinking the same thing. Is if we took that, you know, roughly fifty percent of that pie chart was both services and. Or to replace it, put it into the other buckets where they fall. The vast majority falls into one or two areas. And, and right. it's so it, it is a, a good way to kind of tie that out and think about where are those services going. I mean, I know sometimes we get in the same discussion around, say, athletics, because some shows up in the transportation line, not under the athletics umbrella, yeah. or vice versa, depending on yep. how you're looking at it. So, but thank you very much. Yep, my pleasure. So, at least on, on this not very detailed breakdown a lot of the item, most of the items seem to be um services software not hard goods um based on that do you anticipate a lot of inflationary pressure on the expenses last year versus this year or what you're budgeting now versus what might happen next year so wherever possible i've gotten you know like a, a firm number from Shelly or from Fred Endy at BOCES or whoever, you know, and where not possible, I budgeted for a 4% contingency. 
And we can certainly, which I think is probably a little on the generous side, but who knows in this economy, you know, but yeah, so I'm not, I'm not overly concerned about the inflationary pressures, um, you know, I, but I, I think that um, much of what's in here is based upon someone saying, we expect the number to be X next year. You know, and so like Shelly, for example, gave us, uh, you know, her per DM rate. She says, I know it'll be this next year. So um, we're pretty locked in. Great, thank you. Um, so just another quick question again, talking, it really talks even more to the fact that looking at our overall budget, this is relatively small. Since half of it is BOCES, and BOCES is aidable, in what kind of range? I know it's service by service, but is there sort of, you know, certain services tend to be in the, you know, 10% range, somewhere in the 25% range. And sort of where does the BOCES stuff for this tend to fall? No, I'm just actually sorry, more elementally, since I don't know if every family who's maybe watching knows BOCES. what BOCES right. stands for, what yeah. it is. Like, there's a reason why it's half, and I just thought maybe that would be helpful for people to understand what yeah. it is. I can take the mic, So, so BOCES is a Board of Cooperative Educational Services um, across the entire state. Almost every district in the state is a component member of a BOCES. We are members of the Southern Westchester BOCES. However, you may see across a number of different um, organizations, uh, consultant work that we do partner with other BOCES as well by kind of like piggybacking on the services that they provide there. Uh, the purpose of the BOCES is to share costs in order to be able to provide opportunities that districts would not otherwise be able to do because it would be cost prohibitive. Could be programs per student. Think of a highly specialized uh, special education program or a um, occupational education program, or it could be services that they are offering to us, whether it be our network support um, that is just really difficult to, to manage um, in isolation on our own, or whether it be consultant work or curriculum development or teacher training. Um, there's really limitless number of things that, that the both our Southern Westchester BOCES offers to us. We take advantage of a number of them, and, and you'll see across the whole budget uh, season, a lot of those cases where we are targeting as much of the department's funds to BOCES for the very reason that we do get state aid back on. Um, aid does vary. It depends what it is. Uh, the rate setting on that, I, I don't even, off the top of my head, I wouldn't be able to put the number exactly to each of the line items here. Um, but it is also worth sharing all the positive on the policies of the cooperativeness. If, if, if you were to shop on your own, prices might be a little lower, but on eight of them. There is a net benefit for the district, um, but it is not an equal, we're not getting the same rate, right? Policies pays, they, they choose a rate that works knowing that they are going to get a part of that and that we are going to get aided so to the benefit of us. The few districts that do not partner with BOCES, that will be their argument, is that I think they can shop for these rates on their own. Um, it's just not been in our interest. We, we find it a, a valuable uh, partnership that we have ongoing right now. Um, you know, I think a na neighborhood of almost 20% in these cases is a, is a good estimate for these services. And, and to your point, though, we do still shop these services. Yes. Mm -hmm. Correct. Many, 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 many times. It just, there are many things that we do outside of the yeah. quality of the search, services of the quality that we're looking for. Once you factor in the aid, it becomes economically advantageous to go with it. And I think the Mike's point, one of the, the, I think the critical one for us here is taking the reader and writer's workshop work with Shelly Klein, the packaging in, in BOCES is an important thing. And this year, we're also, we have shifted that accounting. Um, so that we can get aid on the service that we're providing rather than it being an on-site consultant work. Um, and, and sometimes as a district, you have some leverage too to try to, to be able to get consultants to um, work through a in order to be able to provide us that aid on, on the service itself. That's what we did with Joe. Yeah, I mean, that's we we basically, we had been working with her for several years. We said, would you consider, you know, working through BOCES so we can get aid for per DM rate doesn't change, um, but they have an administrative fee that that represents that extra cost. Yeah. Like, like, and so, um, but it's offset significantly by the aid. So in the end, it, it winds up being uh, fortuitous to, to do it this way. Okay. Um, 
just to go back to the uh, inflationary aspect of I think Mike's budget itself is less affected than what you might hear from Paul when it relates to software. Um, programs and teachers are invested in. It's, it's a little bit different in different areas. It's certainly different than what John McKay presented regarding facilities, where we'll see the largest um, increase in that. The goods, the manufacturing, uh, labor, those costs is where we're seeing the, the most significant uptick. So I just have, um, I guess, two um, questions and then one um, just follow up. So um, how do we go about, about, you've done a lot of professional development in the elementary schools and introduced a lot of different programs. How do we um, go about evaluating whether or not you did enough professional development, whether people are actually executing the programs as designed and completely where there's kind of space where people need more, um, how do we go about evaluating all that? Um, it depends. Like, so with something, so for example, you mentioned um, a readers and writers workshop. Like, we have standing committees, a reading committee, a writing committee, and they'll oftentimes be charged with, okay, you know, go to this grade level and uh, or go back to your grade levels and find out, you know, what do you want to see more of? What do you want to see less of? Um, our models of working with Shelly have evolved significantly over the time that we work with her based upon the teacher's feedback um, in terms of whether we meet for a whole day or a half day and the spacing of those meetings. So there's a fair amount of, of back and forth in terms of the teachers having an opportunity to um, uh, define the way that we work with Shelly. Now, Shelly's a consultant. It's a little different for Science 21, where they have, you know, they work with, I think, 80 different districts. And, you know, they have trainings, and um, teachers go to the trainings. They like them. They don't like them. Um, and, I, you know, the best that I can do, is, and I have done this a number of times, is reach out to BOCES and say, hey, our teachers don't like X and they want to see more of Y. In fact, once a year, they bring us all together and like what they call the steering committee, um, they bring us all together to give them feedback on Science 21. And usually before I go to that meeting, I'll reach out to the teachers and say, what are your concerns? What are the things that you want me to share at this meeting? And so um, that's one way. I mean, judging the impact of professional learning it's like the holy grail um, <laughs> because it's really hard. And actually, I, I maybe uh, share with the board some of Thomas Dusky's work, who talks about different levels at which you can judge the impact of professional learning. So, for example, at the highest level or the lowest level is just you walk out of the workshop and you fill out a little survey and, and like, yeah, it was really fun, mm -hmm. you know. But does that translate then into the teacher actually understanding it? They could give them a test, I guess, to see if they understood it, right? Like that's another level. Beyond that, are, are they actually doing it in the classroom? Beyond that, are the kids learning whatever it is they're supposed to be learning? So the Gusky levels are a good tool to think about that, but there are so many confounding variables. I'm sorry, I'm getting into dissertation speak here, but no, 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 I spent a lot of time thinking about this yeah. when I was working on my dissertation because judging the impact of professional learning is really hard because there are so many different factors that um, happen between the teacher sitting in a workshop or talking to a consultant and then actually the kid in the desk in the classroom. But um, we do try to, like I said, use data to uh, assessment data as well as reaching out to teachers. Um, we recently just, for math, um, elementary math, we reached out to the teachers a couple of weeks ago to say, you know, uh, how are you using the digital component of our math program, Think Central? You know, why are you not using it or, or what do you like about it? You know, and so that's kind of in a nutshell how we approach that test. Great. Thank you. And the second piece is that uh, second question is, um, you know, we're, we've done a lot of kind of new curriculum development and some of them programs. I've been hearing from parents about kind of why there's no kind of place to go to look at our curriculum. Is now a good time for us to think about kind of with all these different things, just kind of creating some documentation? Is that something we could invest in? Um, in I think that it's been a sort of a work in progress. We put up a lot of the reading work that we did. Um, we did put up a number of things about that. We've sponsored some parent workshops over the years where um, 
they can learn about our science program. We did one focused on math a couple of years ago. We've done some focused on English. In terms of posting curriculum documents, someone needs to develop them. And so that's um, a work in progress. There's a lot of sort of backfilling as we do new curriculum development. That's a requirement, but in terms of huge scope and sequence existing documents, um, they're in various states to be on the yeah. uh, development. And, and probably some are camera ready, ready to be on the website and others not as much. There are some materials um, though about reading and a few about math as well, I think. Every department here at EHS also has its own web page. Right. I think to, to Manikita, do I hear you asking more about kind of the parent facing, public facing? Yeah, I think, document. you know, I think, yeah. you know, we get, I think, it, you know, during coffee night, I mean, I'm thinking about the elementary schools more than the high schools, the high schools are a little bit more subject specific, right? Um, but in the elementary school, it's kind of like you go to coffee night and you see generally what they're going to be doing that year, but to, but as you go through the year, kind of like, you know, you're not sure what's next and, you know, what the, elements of learning are, even if it's not just the subject matter, I used to always make up the reason why they had to study the things they didn't want to study. Um, it's like, oh, it's using your critical thinking skills. But I, you know, it's, it's just the question around kind of what the ancillaries that are also part of that. And, and I think the reading and writing pieces are really, really important because I think yeah. those are the ones that um, that are, you know, that could, that could come in, to your point, like multiple different types of books and multiple different prompts and multiple different, and so it, it's good to know kind of how to read those mm -hmm. with them and think about them and ask them the right questions. So mm -hmm. yeah, I think it is. It is yeah, so I even the, the reading behaviors, case. you know, even mm -hmm. some of the learning behaviors, reading behaviors, having those forward facing for parents or some things. Yeah, yeah. That we can yeah, that's just, I mean, just something I've been hearing, uh, hearing parents ask me about um, recently. And then the last one you triggered by your, by your, um, by your note, I, we did a, didn't we do a social science traffic? Did we ever see the results? Of the social, was that right at COVID? I tried to remember exactly. Yes. That so happened. yeah, I did present to the board. I don't remember exactly when um, on the outcome of the tri-state social studies visit, and then everything ground to a halt. <laughs> and to be completely honest, we have not done a lot gotcha. on it. Um, but you know, we like I said, last year was just yeah, keeping our head above water. This year, I started to talk some more with uh, Dan Shuckett about. You know what which threads we can pick up certainly his department is looking at, um, carefully at with all the talk about american history lately and mm -hmm. really how do they how are they telling that story in a way that honors all different perspectives and voices so um, but we have we had the visit they gave us the report um, we went through the report identified the areas we wanted to work on and then we didn't really get the chance to work on last year. <laughs> right, in, in light of, of current events of the last several years, I would mm -hmm. say this is a really timely mm -hmm. uh, moment to proceed with, with, with that work. So it's it's great that you're starting to, to yeah. pick back up on it. And, yeah. uh, I think the, the community appreciates full movement there. Um, I just want to say on a personal note that when you were when you were doing what you called your dissertation speech, that was I, I understood it and it was fascinating. <laughs> and I generally don't understand that. It was that was a great explanation from my perspective. I really appreciate it. Oh, great. Uh, hearing how you uh, evaluate the effectiveness of professional development and why it can be so valuable. Um, I stepped on your foot. I'm sorry. I don't know. Sorry. I just wanted to um, like kind of follow on what my teacher was saying about the curriculum and um, kind of having tools available to parents. You know, someone just said to me, a parent just said to me the other day, you know, I think the last two years have made it more obvious than ever that, you know, kids bring home to school and they bring school home. And so to have something like that where the parent can support the, the work that the teachers are doing in the classroom, I think would be helpful. And the other comment I wanted to make is that it sounds like there's a lot of work being done to kind of bring, you know, like a common language to multiple departments um, at the grade level. If you look at the, you know, Science 21 and Reader's Workshop and Writer's Workshop, it seems that this might be an opportune moment to be able to find those things. I know that Science 21, if parents are interested in knowing what their kids are doing in Science 21, you can look online and find that. So um, it seems like there might be some easy paths forward in some of these areas, at least, to give parents comfort that they know what their kids are doing when they're not together with them. 
a lot of our programs also they include like at the beginning of each unit they include a, a sort of like a family letter that and many of our teachers i know take advantage of that they'll send that home like we're starting a new math and focus unit there's actually a parent letter that's included with that um that many but not all of them will send home just as a heads up they call it a family connection or it's, depending on the program it's called different things but um some of our teachers take advantage of that Right. And, and I and I think just to follow on that, like people are looking for information in so many different places these days. So it's sort of also like finding out where is it that they want to get that information. So I think having it more than one place could be helpful. Sure. Any further questions from actually I have another one. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we've had a lot of emphasis over the over many years on elementary school curriculum. And I guess the question is, is there any um thinking about uh, the high school curriculum at all and changes that we want to make there or not changes but evaluating whether or not we still have a curriculum that is competitive and appropriate for our high school students yeah no that's a great question and um certainly the, some of the project-based and problem-based learning work that we've done with jill has been focused on that the challenge in high school is that it's so content-based and so you have those silos of departments, many of whom have done really incredible work, either on curriculum and or professional learning for their teachers. Um, but it has to, it oftentimes, sadly, happens within those silos. Um, you know, it's hard to get kids, teachers, everyone to think about the connections among disciplines and not just what goes on in my discipline solely. So, that, you know, there have been significant developments i mentioned the work that the english department did um but yes and, and so there are it's a little bit different of a challenge um at the high school i know like so last year uh, we worked with all the departments to create these uh, sort of year at a glance documents that outline essentially pacing guides for the whole year we now have those for every course um, and that and we do that as sort of the first step towards uh, documenting and then um, revising the curriculum. Um, and key players in the work at the elementary schools have been the reading teachers. Um, they have been absolutely phenomenal in um, sort of guiding and, for lack of a better word, pushing us forward. We now have two great math teachers in the elementary schools, and the addition of the assistant principal at the elementary schools has been really instrumental. I talk to them all the time about curriculum in a way that I just couldn't speak with past principals because they're too busy just running their buildings, to be honest with you. So we have people in place in the elementary schools who can kind of keep that flame alive. We're working, I think, now to understand how to kind of shift that model to work at DHS and to understand who those people are um, and what their role will be. So the great success we've had in the elementary school, um, we're trying to figure out what that would look like here at EHS um, in a way that honors the, the great work that our teachers do um, that, and that respects those sort of departmental um, lines, I guess, for lack of a better word. Come on, Mike. That's a dissertation topic. <laughs> I think of two phrases are scalability. How do we take what's worked really well for us in the past? Models that have been successful at the elementary. How do we scale that up uh, to the junior senior high school? And then integration. So how do we how do we take that and then integrate it into the fabric of what already exists here? In a way that will be successful, knowing that they are different places and, and are, are very different focus um, in, in some ways. And so that's the, it's the marriage of those two things. I, and I think um, you know, these are ongoing conversations that, that we've had even this week and continue to have often and, and are, are always working. Any further questions? Okay, with that, we'll move on Thank you. We we'll welcome uh, Paul Garapano, Director of Technology, um, to talk a little bit about technology and students, uh, and the interconnectedness of the two, and, and how it relates to teaching and learning as well. Um, and inflation. <laughs> <laughs> Don't want to spoil it. <laughs> uh, you want to 
here at a freaking time. The Italian in me is going to have a tough time sitting down for this presentation. I'm going to want to stand and wave my arms around a lot, but you know. Okay. And you can even, since you were part of the OPI, right? When the uh, foreign language teachers, I remember you were being interviewed in Italian. Grab that lapel mic, yeah, and start dancing around. Good evening, hello, hello everyone in the Edgemont community tuning in from cyberspace or TV land, as uh, Mike said. Uh, this is our 2022-23 uh, technology budget proposal. I am Paul Garifan, I'm the Director of Technology and Information Systems and our Data Protection Officer. Great, you can go right to slide two, Brian. thanks. So I sometimes start off the budget presentation with these bubbles, uh, uh, which are emerging themes or initiatives in technology. And um, as I usually do, I look back at the previous year's uh, budget proposal. And ironically, <clears throat> with the theme of this year's theme of connecting learning to life, as it pertains to technology, the themes didn't change that much from last year. We had so much emergence in technology and how we were using technology that web design and podcasting and streaming, even though they weren't new, they were really um, shuffled to the front and center in our classrooms. Um, students last year, instead of using uh, Oak Tag to do a poster we're creating a podcast for you know out of sheer necessity for illustrating their understanding um a lot of our students were, were using web design um, for similar illustrations of understanding um, virtual learning and streaming were synonymous with you know the pandemic and how we were really facilitating instruction and learning um, technology it really connects learners to the world around them and offers opportunities that might otherwise be available. If you can go to the next uh, slide, Brian, please. Um, so the idea of, of technology connecting learning to life, it's not true. Technology doesn't connect learning to life. Meaningful, intentional, purposeful, use of technology connects learning to life. Instruction connects learning to life. The technology is, as we all know, it's just a conduit, right? It's the medium for what we use it for. And um, in walking around our buildings, as I try and do on a daily basis, I wanted to just kind of set the stage for uh, you know, our board members or community members who haven't had a chance to be in a classroom these past couple of years, because they're really supercharged with technology. Um, our, our faculty and our students have really embraced this, this mode of instruction and learning. And just to kind of give you a glance, you know, we have our, our accessible Wi Fi that runs at 800 gigabytes, which even at the height of the pandemic, when we were streaming and we were in the hybrid learning environment, really held its own and kept the classes running and kept everybody connected outside of Edgemont and in Edgemont. Um, all of our classrooms are now outfitted with our interactive Promethean panels, document cameras, teachers have multiple devices. Some use a, a, a workstation like this, which is actually a Chrome base, uh, which is a, a flat screen Chrome device that's interactive. We have the traditional setups of PCs, um, some of our teachers use Chromebooks to move around the room. Um, we're basically a one-to-one -one school district. All of our students' grades five through 11 now have take-home devices. And all of our K-4 classrooms have essentially a one-to-one -one setup. So not that they're using them all day, every day, but they're there, they're available for use. Um, and the only deviation is in our art classrooms where uh, we have more specific technologies using uh, the Mac products, MacBooks, iPads, and uh, iMacs. Great. 
next slide. So we've been talking about our goal components and um, I've been fortunate enough to supervise, lead, facilitate the, the um, uh, goal component three, which is connecting learning to life. And we've had some great conversations. We've made some great strides. We have a, uh, a draft of an action plan. And a lot of our conversation and, and what, what I've really gravitated back to when it comes to technology and connecting learning to life, as I said, is that purposeful instruction, those powerful connections of learning, our students learning to the world around them, right? It's how we're using the technology that's so important. Uh, next slide, Brian. I have just a few examples here, and this is really just a quick snapshot of a, a, a couple of units or learning activities where technology is being used to connect learning to life. Um, in some of our lower elementary classrooms, um, with the facilitation of our K-12 instructional technology specialist, Andrea Nash, she works with our teachers. Um, they have a unit where they're animating storytelling. And this is a, a unit where students create a short story about a life event that's important to them. Um, and that could be something that happened to them or something that they were exploring. Um, and they use these programs to bring their stories to life. And it's really remarkable, you know, how our, our, our first graders or our second graders are, are taking these ideas and these experiences and actualizing them through the Chromebooks, through the Google apps, using applications like Flipgrid and Seesaw and Book Creator. And they're, they're turning their learning into life. They're making these really deep connections with these experiences that they've had. Um, we've got this great unit in our junior high school around classroom redesign, where the um, students are given a budget. Some of you might be familiar with this project, but they're, they're given a budget and they're allowed to choose a learning space and they go through the budget process and design and they have to create um, a transitional learning uh, room. So they're, you know, they're researching uh, mobile furniture and mobile devices. And it's really, you know, it, 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 it's, it's the height of connecting learning to life. And then ultimately they present those findings to a panel and then the uh, Edgemont Schools Foundation uh, in fact, we have a couple of classrooms where the students have actually designed those rooms in our high school. Um, and we have a project in our um, high school, one of our high school STEAM programs, which is industrial package and design. And again, the students are designing what would be real world projects using all of these technologies as if they were in you know, a graphic design studio or working for a company um, in that space. Uh, next slide. Uh, so I mentioned our K-12 instructional technology specialist, Andrea Nash. Uh, Andrea works furiously across the district um, with all of our teachers at some point in time, um, some more than others um, at different times in the year. And, you know, some of the things that Andrea facilitates are our flipped classroom instruction where direct instruction doesn't happen during the instructional day. It happens sometimes in a more asynchronous environment after hours in a space like Google Classroom um, or in another virtual space. Um, Andrea helped author our K-12 Google Classroom benchmarks, which became so important when we went to virtual and then the hybrid learning environment last year because a lot of teachers didn't know what they didn't know. So we were able to draft these classroom benchmarks and a lot of teachers were able to identify strengths and weaknesses that they could, you know, get themselves up to up to speed um, so they could facilitate Google Classroom more effectively. Um, we're always working on digital literacy, information literacy. Um, I'll speak a little bit about our STEAM integration and our STEAM program in a moment. Um, and uh, Mike had uh, spoke about uh, project-based learning, which is really always at the forefront. Um, our professional learning hasn't changed much from last year. We're still do a, doing a lot of our PD virtually. 
Um, when we can meet in person, we do. Usually it's in smaller groups. I will say that there has really been an emergence of peer-to-peer -peer PD. A lot of our teachers, grade level teachers or department teachers are working together, um, sharing best practices and, and you know, maybe starting with Andrea, but then kind of turnkeying it with their grade level colleagues or their department colleagues. And that's just been a, a, a tremendous development over the past couple of years. Uh, we're going to bring back our, hopefully, our in-person lunch and learns in much smaller uh, groups. And of course, we have our Scarsdale Teachers Institute and our Lyric Model Schools. And uh, the Lyric is a component of Southern Westchester BOCES that uh, we use for a lot of services. And their model schools is a, what is mostly now a virtual professional learning space that a lot of our teachers uh, take advantage of. But... So the STEAM classroom, I think, really epitomizes the, the connecting learning to life. Um, earlier in the fall, we had an opportunity to have some of our STEAM teachers um, speak to the board and to the community about our emerging STEAM program. Uh, we've really made great strides in the past couple of years. And in a moment, we'll take a look at some of the courses that we have and a couple that we're, we're hoping to add. But the STEAM classroom, is about not just the, the acquisition of skills, but the application of skills. And the curriculum that we use in our junior high school STEAM program, the Project Lead the Way curriculum, is all about connecting learning to life. Um, from the learning activities to the projects, the students are really engaged in design thinking and team building and problem solving and critical thinking real world problems. Uh, and again, this is just a snapshot. Um, you know, we, we really began our um, our STEAM program, especially with the project lead the way curriculum in grades five through eight. We're going to add a couple more um, units in our seventh and eighth grade next year. Um, and you know, the hope is over the next couple of years to continue to version out um, the STEAM program to our elementary grade levels and in our uh, high school program. Um, so subsequently this year, um, we're also offering a new uh, technology plan. Every three years, New York State requires uh, every public school district to author a technology plan. Um, we were given an extra year because of the pandemic. Um, it was supposed to be due last year, but they gave us an extra year. You can't see it here, but one of the one of the additions is that lower bubble. Thank you, Brian. The lower bubble there, the, the one of the biggest developments or additions to the to the new technology plan is a comprehensive instructional technology PD plan that the state is requiring every school district to have. Fortunately, we have a lot of professional development in place. Um, we have a professional development committee that it seems most of the days, whether it's a conference day or a release time, technology is part of everything we do. So it was just kind of putting the pieces together um, and then really working closely with Andrea and we have our technology action plan committee, which is comprised of teachers K through 12. Um, we took a, a deep dive into where we're at and where we where we want to be, um, and eventually we'll bring that to the professional development committee. Um, kind of put the finishing touches on the plan. It goes to the lyric. The lyric signs off on it, and then it goes to New York State for approval. And um, that will get us through. You know, that'll be our our plan for the next three years. And this is just an overview. Um, of where we're at every year we're doing you know little bits of, of upgrades and development to our infrastructure um, we're running over a 10 gigabyte network um, with an 800 megabyte bandwidth and what that means is you know in a space like this we're able to run 800 megabytes to give you an example most households are running at about 100 megabytes so again when we have a class of 20 to 25 students with Chromebooks out at the junior, senior high school. Some of them have other personal devices out. One of the first things I do when I get in every morning is 
I will look at the bandwidth from the day before just to make sure we're okay. Um, we do have an agreement with the Lyric that they also have, everybody's watching it, we have watchdogs. If we get to a point where we have to do an emergency increase that can through Verizon and through our best web connection, um, we can increase that literally overnight. But for now, we're, we're, we're in pretty good shape. Yeah. Okay, so the proposed, proposed budget summary, um, is a little misleading. Usually the technology budget is about six to 8%. Last year it was about a 10% increase um, because we did have some unexpected needs. Why do I say it's misleading? Um, we have a couple of leases on our new centralized printers, um, all in one printers, the printers, scanners, copiers. Um, if you remember, we've removed all of our standalone classroom printers and we've gone now throughout the, the entire school district, we have cloud centralized printing. And um, in working with our um, account manager, Bosi, she strongly recommended that we take those line expenditures and centralize them through the district office. I don't know, Brian, if you wanna. I, I think you're explaining it well. I think we, given that the service is, um, more holistically looked at as like individualized and on school based, we've shifted that whole line into the accounting in the, in the business office. And so we'll be absorbing that and we'll see that in the, in the line by line analysis later. Um, so taking those costs out, which were significant and we yeah. have savings through the approach that we're taking to both the centralized printing and copying. Um, if we were to compare it to previous years, the overall expenditure is going to be down. Um, but we're just absorbing it and similar to the conversation with Mike and, and Shelly Klein's line, it's an accounting practice to get us in a place where it's a little bit easier to manage and there's only one person, me or whoever <laughs> in our office, looking at it rather than Paul and I having to coordinate back and forth on this. Yeah. Um, so that's why I say it is a little, little misleading because you might say, well, you know, considering everything that we're doing, we need, you know, more technology, but don't worry, we're, we're getting all that technology as we as we always do, um, just kind of decompartmentalizing it a little bit differently. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a, a forecast expenditure breakdown. Um, similar to Mike, uh, the majority of the technology budget are Lyric or Southern Westchester services. Um, and, and the next slide breaks down what those services are. Um, we have our steam expenditures, hardware expenditures, uh, our Chrome expenditures are increasing every year because we're getting to the point now where our initial Chromebooks of five, six years ago are starting to be needing to be recycled through. Um, and um, minimal infrastructure uh, costs for next year and our software inflation. Yes, software is going up. <laughs> um, a lot of our vendors, um, our, our practices uh, with Brent Kammerer, who is our database specialist and my right and our CIO and my right hand man on a day to day basis. Um, every fall we email all of our vendors and we try and get an idea much like Mike said to try and get an idea of what the costs will be. And they all said, you know, they took a break over the last couple of years, knowing that school districts were doing the best they could to kind of get through things. But now, the, now the prices are going up. Um, that's not to say that I still don't haggle because I always try and you know get the most bang for the buck. But yes, a lot of our costs have gone up. Um, Andrea and I did a a very thorough inventory survey with all of our teachers to ensure that the applications that we are currently subscribing to are being used to the fullest extent. And we found that some are not. Some of them were really popular and, and useful or more useful during the hybrid learning environment or remote instruction, like a screencastify where teachers were recording, literally recording their lessons, putting them up in classroom. Um, and they're not doing that as much. Some are still sticking with the flip model but some are moving away from that. So an application like that, we're moving away from, but some other applications are emerging and some costs are going up. So doing the best we can to level that out. 
Uh, next slide. Yeah, and I'll just add in the point. I think the other thing that has happened through the pandemic is uh, there was so much free or very cheap software delivered as a great business practice that has hooked people on practices. And so I, I'm really appreciative of the fact that Paul and Andrea have done that deep dive with teachers because they're um, short of that. We could just be in many different areas, you know, kind of utilizing what came from people and, and, and uh, supporting things that are being done by just a few because it was just so readily available. And so I, I think that that deep dive has really helped us kind of hone in on, on the programs that are providing the greatest impact um, and are, are most widely used by our instructional staff. And I'll also say, in, and also just in, in frequent conversations and meeting with Mike and understanding, again, what is the, the, the connection, you know, what technology is going to support our curriculum and our, and, and our instruction. And that's a huge component to those decisions. Um, here's a quick breakdown of our Lyric services. Uh, four or five years ago, we went from a consortium district to a managed IT district. And what that means is we don't need to have experts in the verticals, the systems, the infrastructure, the software, the Google. They have that at the Lyric. So the managed IT districts, when we run into a situation, our amazing technical support specialists, just to give them a shout out, um, when they run into something that might take them a half a day to figure out, now they can go back to an expert at the Lyric in that managed IT service and kind of pass it off to them, and they might have an answer like that for us. Um, we have our field support. We, we have one um, Lyric technical support specialist in Evan Botiglieri, who works in Edgemont full time. Um, and, you know, again, we have networking services, model schools, backup rec recovery. Some of our software we purchased through the Lyric um, to get a little bit of aid. And um, we have our installment purchase agreements to have a couple of slides on it. So kind of the big ticket items for projects and expenditures next year. I said the Chromebooks are K, the, the Chromebooks that are in K4, we've really moved the Chromebooks, the older Chromebooks down to the lower grades, but they, they need to be replaced. Um, we're trying to do it through the operating budget and not have to, you know, wait for one of our um, installment purchase agreements to mature and do it in one lump sum. We're trying to do it piecemeal over the next couple of years. And quite frankly, the students need it because they're using the devices, putting a lot more demand on the devices. In fact, the only Chromebooks we're buying now, we went from a four gigabyte to an eight gigabyte. So we're, we're, we're only buying stronger machines now because the students are putting such intense demands on the machines on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, our cloud-based learning applications, that's all the software that we have that we subscribe to. Um, our STEAM program, device repair parts, we don't, a, a huge savings over the, over the past two years is we don't send our devices out anymore. We repair them in-house. Jonathan Espinoza, who's one of our technical support specialists, became a Dell certified repair specialist. And not only does it save us money, it saves us time. The students can literally walk into our department offices and Jonathan, if it's a broken screen or a keyboard, if he's available, he can swap it out right on the fly. And that really, um, you know, that just kind of keeps the workflow of our students and teachers going on a day-to-day -day basis. And cybersecurity, we have a comprehensive cybersecurity training program that's ongoing um, and you know, we'll continue to, uh, to use that. Yeah. Paul, can you speak a little bit maybe we can uh, tag team this one, the um, implementation of, of additional um, supports to help support our cybersecurity uh, programs in-house. I know we've talked as, as a board about um, insurance and, and cybersecurity insurance and what we are doing right now is, is looking forward to next year as to how we can continue to implement additional practices in-house that will help us both provide the safest environment that we can, but also um, to be able to ensure that when we go out to secure policies in the future, that we have the criteria met that will uh, provide us the greatest opportunity to do so in a cost-effective way. So Paul and I have been working uh, with the Lyric, again, our BOCES partners who keep coming up here tonight 
um, in our, our looking at its implementation plan that's going to help us start to address some of that this year. But we're also budgeting for next year, which does come with some supply costs. Mm -hmm. Uh, for example, the, the most um, maybe the most significant item right now, there's two pieces to it. Is one is there's software that, that we would have to subscribe to, and then there is um, an actual like hardware, like a token uh, that would help allow multi-factor authentication for users. Um, you know, many of us go through multi-factor authentication through maybe your own home bank um, and maybe do it on your cell phone. We need to provide a service that can work independent of people's cell phones. You know, they call them Ubi keys. Yeah, Ubi cards, Ubi, Ubi, keys. Cards, Ubi yeah. keys that, that provide unique codes and access points that can kind of help with that. So that is also embedded here in, in our uh, plans for next year. Um, it, it, uh, we see as one of those costs that has potentially a net savings or, or at least is eating into some of the additional costs that we know we take on in areas outside of the technology budget, namely in insurance, um, that by spending a little here, we might be able to reduce costs somewhere else as well. Yeah. And and really the two, sort of the two factors are, the, is the hardware for multi-factor authentication, but it's the people component. Um, that, that training is so important. Um, we've already gotten, we had a short bulleted list and uh, they were asking, do we run phishing scams, which we do. Sorry, teachers, we do run through the background. <laughs> Safe, um, but our teachers have been really vigilant about you know um, um, watching the training modules, participating in the phishing scams, because sometimes if they accidentally click, it says, ah, you took the bait, they'll call me. I'm so sorry, is everything okay? Yeah, everything's okay, that's why we're doing it. Practice it you know, in a safe environment. So um, yeah, on those two fronts, we're, we're doing the best we can to make sure that Edgemont moves forward in the, in the safest way possible for everybody. Um, so, uh, and lastly, we have two installment purchase agreements, which are loans that we take out through ultimately New York State, but through um, BOCES. Um, one which we took out in 2019, which was for a purchase of uh, Promethean panels and Chrome boxes and Chromebooks. Um, that's going to mature in 2023. And the other one we took out last year which was for to outfit the rest of our classrooms with the interactive Promethean panels. And, and boy, good thing we did because the teachers that didn't have them, they, they, they let us know. So they're, everybody's happy. We have Promethean boards, uh, panels across the district. Um, and that's the technology budget proposal. I look forward to any questions or comments you might have. Micah? Okay. Um, yeah. Um, on the screen where you said you have one hundred and fifty-seven thousand dollars for Chromebooks that we are buying outright, mm -hmm. how many Chromebooks is that? Uh, at about three hundred and fifty dollars a piece. Brian, you're good at math. Oh, five hundred. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got five hundred like a stereo. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I was going right to my calculator. Yeah, I was, I was too. So, okay. and then just to give you an idea, that's, you know, at most classrooms get anywhere, that's for lower elementary, anywhere from 18 to 23, 24 Chromebooks. So however many grade levels that ends up being. The goal is over the next couple of years to refresh all right. of K4. So that'll that'll do a nice chunk. It's about 25% of our students. I think. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's a lot. Okay. Um, by taking printing out of your budget, what was your savings and where did it go? So there technically weren't any savings when you're saying that well, you mean, to your budget, you move something from your line item to his. Right. So that means you had savings in your budget because your budget went up 2%. Compared to last year, it, it went down from 10% to 2%, but literally the, 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 the difference in that percentage was the migration of the centralized printing from technology to the district budget. So, so there weren't really savings, it was just a reallocation of expenditure. 
So I, I understand where you're going. So you're speaking about the increase of 10% last year, right? Year to year increase now 2%. But the actual dollar budget, so it's funny, I, I wrote this down. I knew that question was going to come up, and I have it prepared in a different binder that's not in the room right now. Oh, so well, what, what the actual, like, I was trying to think what the actual cost is associated with the printing. So say you say it's $50,000, right? 50, right the, 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 the printing would normally cost $50,000 from your budget, but you've moved it over there, so you don't have that expenditure in this budget. Right. But but you've clearly spent 48000 because or fifty thousand because your budget went up two percent. Yep. So you you spent fifty thousand somewhere else. Where did it go? What increased in your I, other than software? Which is uh, we, you know okay. I mean? lyric services typically go up anywhere from two to four percent, and that's okay. fifty. I think it's fifty seven percent of the technology budget. Right. And again, that's not written in stone. We get our what's called the RFS, the request for services, at the end of January. Uh -huh. But our account manager tells us to any human-related services put a two percent increase to, like the the lyric field support. Okay. Two percent. Anything technical in nature, like we get all of our our um, internet and our um, backup. That's typically a four percent increase. Okay. So that's really the majority of the increase. And then you factor in a little bit of the software. You know, some of our vendors have increased their prices, right. and that's really where the rest of the savings went to. Okay. And then one more question: um, If our eight hundred gigabyte need needs to increase, you wake up and you say, "Oh, today's the day." Um, what's that cost difference? And is that factored in? Uh, I'd have to go back and look at the numbers. It's not huge. Okay. Um, because we did it right before, right when the pandemic, where when we came back to school in person or in hybrid, we went from 500 to 800 okay. because we we ran some preliminary tests and we spiked and we knew that we had to go. We didn't know if we were gonna have to go to a gigabyte, so we left it at 800. But I would say if we had to go from 800 to a gigabyte, it would be under five thousand dollars annually. Yeah. All right, thank you. Sure. Those services have come down a lot over the years. Great. Right. I can tell you well. Yeah. Just the numbers that you're saying compared to when I was sitting in that seat, it's amazing. Yeah. Where it was a big deal to go from 1.5 to 4 megabytes. Right. <laughs> Tens of thousands of dollars. We're just giving megabytes and gigabytes away now. And it's all aidable because it's through Bozy. Right. Yeah. Uh, so my question, you know, this whole 2%, 22%, everything looks very... <laughs> deceptive right everything has so so thanks for explaining all those numbers my question for you is that given that your budget is much larger how do you handle variances when they happen because as we said you know jen said earlier the inflationary environment so just how is the process of any kind of uh, variances managed as a budget manager of technology well i think we can all say going into the budget preparation we need to be at two percent we're Sue, somewhere Sue Sharp and just smiled. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes that's unrealistic. So then it, it, it's a needs assessment. And um, it, it could have been possible that instead of 150, instead of 500 Chromebooks, we might have needed a thousand Chromebooks this year. And, you know, maybe we would have had to then prioritize other areas that we would have maybe had to forego for next year. Maybe there would have been a software application or a service through Lyric or Southern West Books, Southern Westchester Bosies that we either would have had to cut in half or further negotiate. But it really boils down to what are the primary needs for the district. And um, for next year, having Chromebooks accessible, reliable, accessible Chromebooks is really paramount. And uh, I'll just be a dollar question. I'm, this is my fourth year on the board, and I learned the full form of OCs today. Can I know the full form of Lyric? Mm -hmm. The, 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 the yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Lower Hudson Regional, Regional Information Center. Thank you. Yeah, it only took me like five or six years to remember. <laughs> that. So. Thank you. It took me a while to realize it wasn't spelled like L Y R I C. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think, thank you for asking that question about the. And I think the word that comes out of me is prioritization, right? So both in the budget development and then also in our spending plan, because those are really two different things. If we you know, build a budget now in the spring and winter time, to, that's supposed to carry all the way through the end of next school year. Um, and we go back 
24 months ago, do we know what our needs were then for what was to occur the next two years? It's not always the case. Um, and so I'm really appreciative of, of all of the budget builders, in particular these two, in, in developing something um, that doesn't require a whole lot of refinement before we came here today. Um, I have not had to push back and say, you know, we need to lower this and, and where can we find those, those um, areas to really push back on right now? They could do a great job of addressing the needs and really thinking about how, what will impact students um, most in, in the coming years. And then, you know, we do meet regularly as well to look at what our spending plan is right now. Um, where are our expenditures and our encumbrances for this year? Do we feel as though the budget that was allocated is sufficient for that? Uh, where do we have other areas where we're seeing savings or a surplus that we might be able to shift to to do some pre-purchasing? So, for example, we're starting to get to that phase now in the year where we might need to look and say, we have planned expenditures for Chromebooks. If we anticipate a surplus in another area where we can allocate some of that now, uh, we might do so to offset and balance next year as well. Thank you. I'm not going to ask the inflationary question because <laughs> between your, the heads up and, and Nilesh's question, I think you, you answered it more than enough. Um, I do have a little thing I circled because um, I, I thought it was fantastic was the you talked about the emerging peer-to-peer uh, -peer professional learning. And I think that's fantastic, both in terms of um, giving the teachers ownership of some of these things availability i mean simply having someone in the building you know in the next in the next classroom as opposed to having to wait for the consultant um do you see that also as potentially down the road of area for cost savings if, if we have in-house people who are experts in these areas as opposed to having to go out and get outsiders yeah potentially you know I think part of the reason really, as I said, was, was out of necessity. Um, when you need something, when a teacher needs something in an instant, Andrea is not always available or I'm not always available. And, and because technology or instructional technology is, is so prevalent, people are more readily able to share best practices. And I think that, yes, it's cost savings in that instead of yes maybe bringing in additional consultants or subscribing to other um, consortiums or programs where we would have to pay for pd we can we can do that further in-house um, one we were talking recently in our professional development committee one of the most successful um, conference days that we had was um it was what did we call it mike where Everybody was like a, a choose your own. Oh, the unconference. The unconference. And there were a lot of different things happening that day, but there were a lot of technology or there were some technology best practices. And that kind of gave a, a, a window into what was to come and what is happening now, which is a lot of peer to peer professional learning, definitely around instructional technology. So, yes, I do see potential cost savings in, in, the, in the long term. Awesome. <laughs> Um, this is more just a, a confirmation from the number of Mike. So we will later on in the budget process show them more details so we can actually, because this is a net of all, a number of different things going on. So look more like what things went up, what things went, the net went down, just so we can get a better sense of what's driving. Again, not the difference, because in the end, there isn't much of a difference, yeah. but sort of how we got to this point relative to last year. Yeah. Yeah, and with that line by line, line analysis trends and things, yeah. there's, there'll be some descriptions that okay. you know itemize most cases, you know, the, the most expensive items um, and, and most uh, representing the largest chunk of each of those lines. Great, okay. thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Presentation. Thanks so much. Yeah, I had just a quick question around um, Chromebook investment. Because I am noticing as I move further and further uh, up in the grades that more and more of these kids have their own um, devices. Yeah. And yet I still have a bunch of Chromebooks in my house, which have not been returned. I promise I return to you. <laughs> so I'm just wondering, like, do we have usage data on how many of these Chromebooks are actually still being used by the students as they kind of end up in the middle school, high school area? And the usability of those Chromebooks. I mean, I think that part of the reason why my kids have transitioned is because the delay, you know, to your yeah. point, the processing power of some of those old books were not, was not quite as 
um, and strong. So I'm just wondering if we think about the program, what is the real life cycle of a Chromebook? Yeah. What is the life cycle of a user here of a Chromebook versus a more substantive computing tool, um, et cetera? So. Uh, much like the uh, the social studies tri-states right before the pandemic, <laughs> <laughs> we were ready. We, we have a one-to-one -one committee. Alec, in fact, sits on it. And we decided that we were going to, when students got to 10th grade, give them the choice of keeping their Chromebooks through senior year or returning them. But if they kept them, it, it was on the onus of the student to maintain the device because we know that the majority of our 11th and 12th graders end up getting their own devices. Right. So, but the pandemic hit and it was, we need to get Chromebooks available to anybody and everybody. So now that we're coming out on the other side, I suspect that next year we will reenact that and that was also another reason why we are now only buying the eight gigabyte Chromebooks so that they are strong through 10th grade. Yeah. Because any device, uh, most devices, like a, a television at home, four, five, six years, it starts, you know, it, it starts slowing down and newer technologies come out. That seems to be the wheelhouse from fifth grade to 10th grade. And then if the student wants to keep it, they can keep it. But you know the onus is on them um, for the upkeep, and that's not saying if they can't connect to the Wi-Fi, but if they you know need to put a new processor in or the screen cracks, um, and that seems to be the trend in a lot of districts that fourth or fifth through tenth grade, and then when students get um, into eleventh and twelfth grade, they typically get their own devices. Yeah, I might recommend like surveying kids in ninth and tenth grade because what I'm hearing at least. They are for other purposes. They are yeah. acquiring devices and could use those devices because they do have more. They they are more powerful for, yeah. for them to use. Anyway, I just think I, it's a great program. I think we should do it. Absolutely, should do it. We should do it, especially in places where we do want to make sure that we can manage the students' access and that we're not using random apps and things like that. Yeah. Um, but I also am wondering what the um, enforcement is of personal devices in some of these um, younger grades here. So seventh and eighth grade and whether or not people are bringing devices. To yeah, again, pre-pandemic, we didn't allow seventh, eighth and ninth graders to use their own devices. Right. Um, but because the demand, quite frankly, we had a shortage, we had an yeah. inventory shortage because yeah. we had to start, the, we started a loaner program for families who had students who were learning remotely. So we, put a suspension on that. Um, I suspect next year that will come back into play. That's all students grades five through nine um, will have to use our Chromebooks while in district. And then in 10th grade, there's a little bit of wiggle room. And then again, as you move into 11th and 12th grade, they typically um, start to bring in their own devices. But we have a very organized asset management of our devices. Um, we're constantly monitoring usage, whether it's through the Google Admin Console or through our asset management tool. And I would say our frequent flyers are in our offices for repairs and upgrades, firmware upgrades are the ninth and 10th graders. And right. we do the best we can to you know, keep those devices running for as long as possible. And sometimes we do take them and we'll give them kind of like a refurbished, but a higher functioning device. Well, um, I'm just wondering, Two things occurred to me as um, that conversation was going on. Um, one is when we take Chromebooks out of circulation, are we using some of those for parts for replacement of the issues that arise that kids bring in? That when we can, yeah, when we can. But sometimes those devices that are coming out of circulation are coming out for a reason that they're just out of circulation. But if we can, yes, use a screen well, or good. a keyboard or a trackpad, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, we recycle and refurbish. And even when they get recycled or when they get retired, they go, I think, uh, a meeting in December, I spoke a little bit more about how we go through the sustainable method of recycling those devices for parts. And if, if they're a working device, 
go to another school or organization that's in need of that device. And then the other question is, um, so at 11th grade forward, if a kid keeps the Chromebook, they are responsible. Do we have a, a program in place to help kids who may be keeping it because it's an affordability issue for the family? Absolutely. If there are circumstances where that's the case, we will do everything we can to make sure that any student that needs a device for those reasons will have a working reliable device. And do we make that clear to the kids when they come in as opposed to? Yes, okay. we had a whole letter directed and everything. We were ready to okay. move into that program and then everything came to a screeching halt. So I suspect towards the end of this year, beginning of next year, we'll, the, this committee will get together one more time to kind of refresh our notes and we'll send out that communication. Great, thank you. Yep. Actually, you asked. Okay. So, uh, I also knew that actually Chromebook are more secure to viruses, spams, because you know that they're restrictive on what websites you can go. Whereas the student laptops are much more open structure. So in some sense, having Chromebook till the students become mature enough to kind of know what to do is actually better to have them use Chromebook rather than kind of use their own laptop. So, so I completely support that the own laptop should be a policy which should come much later than the students are more mature to have. Yes, they're 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 a more compact, um, reliable um, device. As far as safety goes, though, any device, if you are in our network, if you're on the consortium network, everybody goes through the same filter. Oh. So even if a student does have their own device, they wouldn't be able to access adult content or something that typically would be blocked by our filters, yeah. unless they had a VPN and. Once they go to VPN, it's yeah, it's kind of rabbit hole. Right. The, the one place where the Chrome OS is a more secure OS than the other mainstream consumer OSs. They yes. just aren't. I mean, there may be a few hypothetical ones out there, but you just don't see viruses out in the wild that actually infect. Chrome OS. Yeah. Yeah. Can I just say something about that for a second? Because I think this is just when, you, when your committee meets, I think it's really important component to think about, which is that that's fine. And we should have, if you want to have ninth graders on Chromebooks, that's totally fine. And I'm, I'm in support of that policy. It can't be the Chromebook they got when they were in fifth grade. Like the technology deteriorates. They need it more than anybody. My son sat with his Chromebook trying to submit a paper for half an hour. So it has to be that if we're going to, if we're going to force the kids who need it most and who are using it for kind of higher order types of activities, we got to give them the high performing Chromebooks. Yeah. So I think just in terms of the way we think about the life cycle of a Chromebook and the life cycle for these kids of like my kids are still sitting with the same Chromebooks they have when they first got them and they're not operating well anymore. And now is when they're using them most. Um, and when the, the possibility of not doing the thing, which is like not submitting the paper, is not possible. <laughs> yeah, we bought so, our own because ours died. Yeah, so yeah. It's, that, that's what I mean. Like, I think that it's great that we want them to use it. And I, I'm totally in favor of that policy. But we got to think about how we distribute mm -hmm. them. And again, that's why, in, in hindsight, and the technology, the technology and our need has just grown yeah. exponentially over the last couple of years. Had you told me three or four years ago that we were our students were going to be on a device all day, streaming, you know, in virtual um, learning environments, I would have said, "Oh, well, there's no way that you know a four gigabyte Chromebook's going to be able to do that." But we weren't doing that, right. so that's why we're only buying the eight gigabytes. But yes, that's why I said our our ninth and tenth graders are our frequent flyers, and we try and communicate to the students and to the teachers of those ninth and 10th graders that however small the hiccup may seem come to our offices so that we can at least take a look we'll never let a student leave with a chromebook that's not functioning the chromebook that takes a half an hour to load a paper is not going to stay with that student right, we would right. get them a device that so um okay. yeah be seeing some yeah sure <laughs> send them our way, send them our way. <laughs> <laughs> What about when you get the updated eight, whatever they're going to be giving them to the older kids and then taking those ones that the older kids have and giving them to the younger kids who maybe don't need, or do they also need eight gigabytes? Yeah, we thought about that too. It, 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 
disrupts the cycle of the one-to-one -one program um, okay. because if we then started collecting and the precedent was fourth graders going into fifth graders, it's the beginning of the one-to-one -one program and it's sort of like the initiation into that program. They get their nice new shiny Chromebook um, and then to disrupt that and you know start taking five four or five year old Chromebooks and, and moving them back and then taking the new ones again then we're you know giving a brand new Chromebook to a ninth grader then the whole concept of well you know we're going to end the one-to-one -one program in 10th grade kind of goes out the window it's a whole Got it. yeah. and again it's not saying that it's not a possibility we have this one-to-one -one device committee and we're going to meet again and we're going to talk about all of the possibilities and opportunities for the program for sure. Yeah. Okay. Can I suggest some data gathering for that? Because I think it would be yeah. interesting to know of the ninth grade and tenth grade families, of seventh grade and eighth grade families, potentially when they're thinking about purchasing a device for their student. Because I actually think it's it's feasible for us to buy a whole bunch of Chromebooks if families are planning to buy devices. Not right. that we shouldn't have Chromebooks. And if they're more secure, I, I guess that's okay. But my kids are at home using their computers, not their yeah. books. And and so I just I want to just be and, and we're not doing we're learning that, but I don't want to like you know test the waters and now all of a sudden we're back to everybody using their Chromebooks. Anyway, I just think fiscally we should make sure that we're not buying lots of Chromebooks that are then aging out of being useful and sitting in somebody's house. Um, and instead of like, you know, circulating them. Yeah, if we were gonna revisit and, and purchase new devices for older students, we would definitely do a comprehensive yeah. survey and find out who's using what, what their plans are. And in fact, we did that, something to that effect prior to everything happening. Right. Um, but that data obviously now is, is, is out of date. We, we're gonna need to do that again and, and collect that information for sure. I mean, I'm 100% support, right? If we're doing it in analyzing usage and all those sorts of things, I'd just be a little careful about assuming, and I'm, not, I'm picking on your example now because this would be, you know, something taking a half an hour to submit may or may not be the Chromebook. I mean, one of the reasons Chromebooks work. Paper might have been really bad. I don't know. Yeah, that was, like, no, 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 Google recall, giving you some time to think about this. <laughs> no. uh, but when you think about most of what you're doing with the Chromebooks is document management, they're web pages, right? So they're, they don't need to be with caveats, high power machines. That's why in the art department, they do have right. IMAX, things like that, because they do need things that do need to do rendering, things that need a lot of computational power and memory. Um, I mean, I still have a Chromebook from six years ago that works well for a lot of things. Where they do fall down is, I think the older kids, they suddenly have 43 tabs open. Yeah. Now you have an issue with limited memory. That's what I mean, yeah. Um, yeah. That's why I say nine times out of 10 when a student does come to our department offices, I've yet to see something that one of the guys can't clean, run a firmware update, or do something to, to increase the performance um, substantially. So, um, and it could be just, you know, also our department doing a better job communicating to the students with older devices that don't forget we're here. No, you know, hiccup is small enough. You need to come to us so we can help you out. You'll definitely be overwhelmed in the next couple of weeks. <laughs> They're used to being overwhelmed. That's what we do. <laughs> no question you don't want a kid who's like, Oh my goodness, the world is going to end right now because I've been killing myself on this paper. Right. I can't get it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think it's important when we balance those. We talk about IMAX, we talk about Chromebook. They're different, they're used for different purposes. Right? And I think a lot of students who have purchased their own device, whether it be a MacBook or more higher, uh, higher power PC, they're using it for different things than document management, word processing, spreadsheets, working off web pages, using collaborative learning spaces. So I think you know we need to set our expectations to what do we want students to do with that and what can we provide them to support that. I think one interesting way to look at it is the cost per student per year that we're spending on a Chromebook. If they're using it for roughly five years and it costs roughly $300, it's $60 a year 
for a device that connects them to the internet and gives them access to a different world in the classroom. That price point um, is what has allowed us and other schools to become one to one. Um, if you think of the schools that adopted one to one practices, one was a neighbor in New Jersey years ago, it was 20 years ago. It was, it was um, Apple products. And that, that expense, I can't even imagine what it was at that time. Um, the reason we've been able to open the classrooms and students is because that price point is so low. And I think we have to think what's our expectation at that price point. A few years ago, um, we were still supplying students with TI-84 graphing calculators in the high school. When I left uh, teaching in the department, those were $120 a piece on state contracts. When I think about what, although they're excellent and, and great tools, but what that provides a student at that cost versus what we're getting uh, with access to a wealth of information and connectivity, um, it, it has been something that has really saved us. Yeah. And I echo everything that I'm hearing because I, as, I'm, I'm not on my Chrome device, I've chosen to bring our, our Dell device for this purpose because I think that running a virtual meeting off of it with all of this connected to it is prudent to be done on a different device. Um, and, and I think that that's the balance point for us. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad Victoria is using Chrome. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just reading the board. <laughs> Different tasks. Different tasks. Yeah. Anybody else? Paul, thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Oh, oh. Mike, thank you very much. <laughs> I think just to, to put a, a, an end note on it all, I think Alec, you brought it a couple of times and I, I agree. I think this is certainly not the deep dive tonight. Plenty of opportunities down the road. Didn't want us to get too lost in those details if refinement is going to come. And I think we just have too many unknowns this early in the process for us to, to do that. So rather than save, to save our country, to jump, we presented some of that deep dive. We'll, we'll hold off on those until uh, a later date. So thank you all for the questions and the comments. And we'll follow up on the ones that, that are outstanding based on that. Okay. I, I didn't announce before, but there are no comments from the public on the uh, on the spreadsheet document that we have. Um, and we now move on to the consent agenda. Um, I would ask if we could pull out uh, I-5 and 7. Sure, I'd like to uh, ask the board's approval of G personnel, numbers one through 10, eight students, number one. one. Did I miss something? You have one through 11? G personnel, one through 10. This is up to my Oh, okay. Oh. Eight students, number one. And I business, number. One through five. Four. Seven, four, oh, sorry. Four, four and six. Four, six, four and six. Do I have a motion to approve? Now it's first and one second. All in favor? Unanimous. Um, like to you can take five and seven together if you want. Is it five and seven or five? Four and six. Five and seven. On I. Five and seven. Is it the cadence therapy session? And the retriever and the oh yeah, I thought we were going to do the never. Oh, you wanted to pull that one out. What okay. numbers did you just say? <laughs> That's a good question. Let me get one. Let us start again. One at four and six. We want to take out four separately, oh. right? We want to take. Five, five, and seven. five and seven. Okay. So I would like to ask the board's approval of numbers one through three and number six. Okay. Well, I'll say that motion Monica, second the lash, all in favor, unanimous. Okay. okay. So now we'll go one at a time. Take number four. I'd like to ask the board's approval uh, for the authorization to enter into a contract with Speak Sobriety LLC for student assemblies. Motion, Monica first, Alex second. Do we have any discussion? So I'd like to actually thank uh, the ninth grade team of teachers 
as well as uh, Mitch Shapiro, Lauren Moore, Michelle Greenwald, and the high school administrative team. Uh, they have been um, meeting with the ninth grade teachers and talking about the needs of students in terms of making good decisions, importance of making good decisions, healthy decision making, as well as um, use of alcohol and substance abuse. So they reached out to local school districts in terms of um, consultants that they have worked with and uh, to speak sobriety being highly recommended. Um, they're going to work primarily with the ninth grade as well as the parents of ninth graders. And um, they were going to start with, I mean, we don't know if it's going to be an in-person assembly, but the thought is, um, by this time to split them into two so that uh, each half of the ninth grade would be in an assembly and then they would do breakouts by classes so there'd be smaller discussions parent, parent groups as well and um, really just for ninth graders when you think about their past two years mm -hmm. they went from being seventh graders and now got thrown into a high school environment and i think it's been difficult for parents as well because the parents want them to socialize. So maybe their wedding would do some things that maybe they wouldn't have pre pandemic. So I do, it just sounds like a, a great opportunity for the ninth grade students and, and their parents. And Victoria, you said there is a mental health component in this as well. So I, I would say, too, in terms of the decision making, yeah, I'd say that the mental health component was also something that I know um, the school psychologists and counselors uh, asked about. Um, when they they interviewed and were looking for people and asked. So yeah, thanks Judy for bringing that. Uh, so all in favor of it? It's unanimous. Um, and then five and seven are the same. So you want to take them together? So um, ask the board's approval of number five, the authorization to enter into a contract with giving the retriever. The canine therapy sessions and number seven authorization to enter into a consultant contract with Stacy A.S. Williams. So motion to approve. Uh, Monica second the rush. Uh, uh, I have a request just that um, the language on each of these be finalized uh, and clarified as we have already discussed. Yes. Okay. okay. And with that, all in favor? And it is unanimous. Um, the schedule of meetings um, that follows uh, January 18th is the next meeting, but it's an executive session only at uh, 4 p.m. Um, and then uh, the next full board meeting will be Jan January 25th um, here in the D Annex, starting the public session at, at 8 p.m. And the following one will be February 8th. Also here in the Vienna, it's at the, the public session starting at 8 p.m. And with that, we are, yeah, oh, sorry, to, yes. Yeah, I just want to make a remark. So end of September, we have deliberation between the board. Should we continue in person or go virtual? And we said that if we go virtual and we come back, we want to have a fantastic setup. And I must say, I'm so delighted with this setup to have a, a camera, which is not operated by anyone. It goes to the speaker. When the speaker speaks, mm -hmm. it's all automatic. We have our own microphones. So thank you, Victoria. Thank you, Brian, for taking the lead. Thank you. For this and wonderful uh, presentation for the community to have a good experience. So thank you for being here. We're going to really be together again. Thank you, Mila. Okay. Thanks. And with that, we are adjourned. Thank you very much.